Thank you very much. Um, Julianne. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm Julienne, and I will talk in, on behalf of uh, many people with whom I have collaborated in the field. We have the UN Joint Office in Cabo Verde, a WHO uh, team in Guinea, UNICEF team in Guinea, and from the regional office of uh, UNICEF in Dakar. Because I was working as a consultant, and I had the opportunity, and um, I was lucky to have been called and several times and selected to support these, all these organizations in building the risk communication. And uh, I will take you to Guinea and to Cabo Verde to explore what, oops. Yeah, okay. Okay, slide please. It's not there. It's not here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> ah, yes. Ah, great. So I, I would like to thank uh, the organization for inviting me. So from Dakar to uh, Washington. And uh, I was asked to answer to four questions. You know, what practical steps can be used to identify influential and credible people to lead communication campaigns, gain trust with the public, and engage various, various partners on the ground. To what extent have these steps been taken during the recent Ebola and or current Zika outbreak? The second question was, what are strategies to overcome resisting population who want to follow their own interpretation of intervention to control and contain disease? What kinds of gaps in risk communication and community engagement capacity have been revealed from recent outbreak? What resources are needed to fill these gaps? What is the role of data and evidence to inform the development of communication strategy for preparedness and response to future outbreaks? How could data and evidence be better integrated into the response and how should progress be evaluated? Really, I was afraid when I saw that four questions. I say, oh my God, <laughs> I will try to give you, to share my experience from the field and from many of the partners. So this is the, 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 the situation, outbreak in Guinea and uh, in Cabo Verde. I don't want to go around uh, the, the, the slide, you know it very well. And uh, some practical steps. The first of, uh, first of all, you have to build trust. Building trust means developing a strong partnership with communities to get them be owner of the situation. Because the outbreak is not your outbreak, is community's outbreak is a community issue. So they have to be in the center of all the intervention you are trying to do. So first of all, you involve social anthropology in your team. The communication team must have a social anthropologist embedded inside. Meeting with local authorities. You organize a meeting with local authorities, administrative and, and traditional, to share knowledge about the outbreak and need of community ownership. I said share knowledge. I didn't say give lesson. Establish together a list of all stakeholders and partners, not only key ones, because when you arrive at the community, you will have a key partner, a key stakeholder there, they say, we are the one talking in the name of the community. Be careful. They are not always credible and influent. First, the fourth step, you organize a global meeting with the community led by local authority and not by you. 
to inform about the outbreak, the need of community ownership, and the involvement of selected and credible and influent people. They have to know that. They have to do this. This is their outbreak. They have to do it. You just give them means and technical assistance to do it. Be aware that those rulings are not always the credible and influent, as they used to, to say they are. Building trust also means dialogue session, focus group, and or workshop with community to let them select their people who are influent and credible according to their criteria. But you can assist them in that they have to choose among men and girls, women, traditional authority, religious representatives, or individuals. Discuss the motivation criteria of selected influential and credible people and of community. Need for transparency to build trust. This motivation means that for us, you will have to pay some credible and influent. You have to do it, I'm sorry, because you have your salary going around, you have your pay DM, and why don't you want to give them $5 to do their job, you know? So you think about this. In some community, we will ask to give water to the community or rebuild the school. This is also a type of motivation that you have to discuss with the community, okay? Some unexpected, credible, and influent people can be found. Social anthropology may support in finding all those uh, unexpected people. I would like to share with you the experience in Guinea. You know, where we were in Gekedu when the outbreak started, the ETU was at the top of a mountain. So there was a lady at the, the, the down of the mountain selling, street f selling food at the street. So this was the key point to know all the management of the Ebola was there. So one day I went there with my team and I said, I want to know why this place is so overcrowded. I sat down, I, I asked for my rice and uh, potato leaves. And after starting eating, there was a lot of information coming around Ebola, all the rumors, all the misinformation, all the beliefs, everything was there. And the people were, the ETU was a sort of mystic place where things, white men, Western was, were removing organs and taking uh, organs to United States. The CIA was there, you know, in that place eating my rice and potato leaves. So when I asked the people, why are you sitting here? They said to me, this lady know how to put very good spices in her food. This is why we are here. And I said to them, did you trust in this lady to give you the information about Ebola? They say she has all the truth on Ebola. So we went to talk with that lady after we give her the correct information so that when people go there to eat, she was just giving the perfect information we wanted her to share on Ebola. Me, uh, rumors, she was breaking rumors, just serving the rice and potato leaves. That lady was the excellent, credible and influent and unexpected people of, uh, who fight the Ebola with us. So, to what extent have these steps been taken during the recent Ebola and or current outbreak? In Guinea, I'm sorry, these steps have been mainly taken into account as part of the strategy to stop community reluctance. Before that, nothing. Step not extended as a global response strategy. Although we ask, although we advocate to, 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 to work on this approach, but this was not even heard. We were not even heard. We had to battle. We had to advocate. We had to cry to say to the, the partners that this is the, the, the good way to work at community level. And uh, for Zika, uh, some steps started to be taken into account after the evidence of the low perception of the risk regarding Zika, 10 months after the first cases were confirmed and after the first microcephaly cases. I, I would like to, to, to tell you that the outbreak is still ongoing, though, so they are still implementing all the, the, all the, um, the action that was designed with the team. So um, uh, the second question is that was that... Uh, Establishment of a strong, what are the strategies? Yes, now before going to the strategy, yes, yes, what are the strategy? For Zika and the Ebola, we, we, we establish a strong partnership with public and private research institutions to provide evidence and data. I think Dr. Sumo talked about uh, uh, how social sciences, uh, rapid assessment and all the data that were collected. And uh, for Zika, the problem was the low perception of risk, of risk due to weather and the culture and the disease itself. 
you know, uh, Zika, 80% of people are asymptomatic and um, uh, the, the people are not dying of Zika as Ebola. And uh, the problem here was that um, the, the authority uh, didn't, uh, the, 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 the national authority didn't perceive the, the, the risk. And uh, in, in Cabo Verde, people trust in their health system, in their politician, and in their authorities. So if the authority doesn't perceive the risk, the community also will not perceive the risk. So we can't blame the community to say that, uh, saying that uh, mm, uh, they want to do in their own way. But in, Z in, in Cabo Verde, they were just following what their authority was doing or saying. And when the authority perceived the risk, immediately the community also changed their way of uh, behaving. But for Ebola, the problem was huge. The interface between health partners was the point of tension of the whole Ebola response. Local population wanted to be heard. They had their experience to share, and teams were not allowing them to share the experience. And this was exacerbated by failures of communication, which often took the top-down, unidirectional form of expert educating local population. This was a great, a great, a great mistake we did in the field. And what we need was more dialoguing approaches based on knowledge exchange. We, ha we, all, we, have so all to, we, we were also looking for the political, social organization, economy, history, gender, environment. All these influence the communication we are designing. Cultural ways of caring the sick versus Ebola, biosecurity protocols. When a, a, a woman is, a, a baby is sick or a, a, a man is sick, what he needs is just, he just needs to be cherished, to be cared, to be touched, to be given the good food. And this, with Ebola protocol, this was not uh, able to be done because biomedical security protocols were not allowing that. Cultural funerals were also a problem versus Ebola funeral practice. You know, during a normal funeral practice, the, 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 the personal belongings of the dead is, are, uh, um, are given to, 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 to the family and not burned like uh, 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 we, uh, during uh, uh, the Ebola. And houses are not disinfected because there is no problem in the houses, but with Ebola, they, they have to disinfect the house. And also, um, the body has to be exposed because people want to see the body dressed in a very, in a very uh, fair way. They want it to, be, to decorate the body and to make it up, the cherries, to embrace and cry and dance. They want to dance their, their dead people. They want to dance during the funeral rites, and this was not allowed because of, of the, 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 by the, the, the management of the Ebola. Following the strategies again, we build a bottom-up communication. You know, we talked about it yesterday. I don't want to give the details because yesterday we talked about all this strategic uh, uh, communication. And uh, I would just want to share these specific messages that the community developed in Gekedu. Because we had the first message was, uh, Ebola has no treatment and no vaccine. And this message was interpreted in two ways in Guinea. First of all, this message means that for the first time of the history of the modern medicine and Western medicine, you accept that you failed. For the first time, you don't have the solution. This, was, this is how the community interpret this Ebola, no treatment, no vaccine. And when we, the second message was go to the treatment center and people say, we are not going to do it because if you don't have vaccine, you don't have treatment, why do we have to go and die alone in your treatment center? It's better for us to die at home, cherish, embrace, cared, okay? So we organized, when we had 26 villages with resisting, we decided to organize a meeting with them. We say one side, the partners, and the other side, the, 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 the community leaders who were sent by the, the community. And uh, the interpreter was the reverend, uh, one reverend, the pastor of, the, of, the, 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 of the, the zone, the area. And uh, they said to us that they want to develop their own messages. They want to, to, they have their own answer, their own question, and they need answers. Don't these are the messages the community developed. 26 villages developed these this, this messages. What is Ebola? 
Ebola fever is a highly contagious and very severe disease, and not Ebola has no treatment and no vaccine. So what to do in case of symptoms? Contact immediately the chief of the village, the healthcare professional, the community watch community, or call free, or they don't say go to the isolation unit. Is there any person recovered from Ebola? Yes, many people are recovered from Ebola. And we show them that these men are recovered, this is certificate, and so on and so on. Why go into the ETU if Ebola has no treatment and no vaccine? To protect the family to be contaminated by infection, the, by, the infect, and by the infected relative. Because in the ETU, a treatment is given to alleviate symptoms and the patient become very robust and powerful to fight Ebola disease. We didn't say you will have a treatment on Ebola. No, the treatment is to relieve the symptom. And they ask again, which treatment is given? The treatment is given against headache, diarrhea, vomit, body pain, these are the symptoms of Ebola. Exhaustion and the patient is also given good eating. Good eating, eating in French is something like um, bon manger. And the bon manger is the tasting food, you know. And in Guinea, it was the potato leaves with all palm and uh, with, um, with um, shrimps. This is the good tasting and with spices, you know, this is what people wanted to have in the ETU. And we say to them that this will be in the ETU. But before saying that, we negotiate first with MSF to allow homemade food in the ETU. MSF accepted. So patients were having their good eating in the ETU. We communicate that. So yesterday, someone talked about limiting the impact of the risk to be wrong. We have to accept that at this stage of the outbreak, scientists are still looking for answers. Just accept this. We are not going to die for that. Just we have to accept. So other strategy was engagement with and engagement of community to fight resistance. Engaging with means that I am myself part of the problem. I feel that this problem is mine. I'm not just here to give lessons. This is my problem, so please, we are going to sit together and find a solution together. When you accept that you are also part of the problem, at that moment, there is a sort of empathy that is created between you as partner and the community, and you fight together the epidemic. This was done, and this has a very excellent result. Engagement is a sustained process all over the response and not a product. I think someone talked about it yesterday. It's a process, it's not a product. If you engage leaders in this village, know that in the next village you have to do the same up to the end of the outbreak. Don't say, I did it, now I'm going to my hotel and sit quietly and drink my beer. No, you are engaged 45, 40. 24 hours per day because this is your problem. Sometimes I have to say to people in Guinea, you know, I went on mission for three weeks. When WHO called me for the first time at the beginning of the outbreak in April, I went for three weeks and I stayed two years. And I said to them, my husband want to take a second wife because I'm not at home to, to cook for my husband. He want to have a, a second wife. My children are, are criticizing me. So I'm trapped by Ebola. I need you to help me to go back home and keep my husband. This is a critical issue, you know. We have to say that in the field. <laughs> so the other strategy is address rumor and reticence. I think yesterday we did talk about how to do it. And um, in our case, we set a rumor tax force as a subgroup of the communication pillar collecting, analyzing, and the bank rumor through interpersonal communication. We had thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteers in the field, knocking house to house, debunking rumor, talking to people, building trust. You know, they are spreading themselves with, uh, with water and bleach to show, that, to, to show that water and bleach were not killing people. They are washing themselves with that. So it was a sort of engagement with the community, you know, side to side with the community in the field. We document rumor through a magazine of rumor that we were sharing uh, twice per week. We were sharing this magazine to authorities to, to see how we were working, addressing rumors in the field. 
Engagement is a sustained process all over the response. Again, we build also a cross-border approach. One of the successful uh, 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 strategy was this approach between Guinea, for a career, uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone. We call it for a Cambia. And we let the advocacy, we take the two president of the Republic of Sierra Leone and Guinea at the frontier in this village. We were so happy to have the president there. They, were, they, they talked about everything, but they say, just send the army to clean all this. We say, oh no, please not. We are not going to have the army. Please, president, just call the community, say to them that you are protecting them. Please keep the army and the police away. And uh, I don't know if they understood, but we try, we try. So the kind of gaps, yes. Capacity of communicator to address effective risk communication. This was one of the gaps we have in the field. Preparation of communicator to understand the epidemiological management context. Surveillance, case management, sanitation, laboratory, logistics, because communication is a cross core team pillar. It's not just communicating. You communicate what, the, you communicate the technical information. You don't communicate what you want. You communicate what the laboratory is doing, how, wh what, what, what is with, what, uh, when you, they took this, the blood sample, what is the life of those, uh, that blood sample? You communicate what the blood sample, uh, how it will be used in the, in the laboratory. You communicate the care, the, care, uh, the care management, the surveillance. This is what we communicate in that. And we need to know at least how those pillars are managed. How, how, what is the information given, what they are doing? And this means that we need to have this capacity built. And we were not, we, we didn't have this capacity at the beginning, at least at the beginning of the outbreak. We build it on the job. Uh, uh, the, the other gaps were that risk communication was not considered as, as cross-cutting from the authorities. They say that risk communication is a, the last pillar, but risk communica communication is the main pillar in such an outbreak like, like uh, Ebola. The technical brochure with practical tools on how to do. We, we also, this was a gap we had in the field. The coordination of partners, it was a great issue because people wanted to, to dance with their flag, you know, and this flag was also, was a great, great problem in the field. The monitoring and evaluation. We were not able to monitor an evaluation as we should have done. And this was a great gap. The availability of funds and on time. When we have money, money was, there, was not there in time. So uh, we have to all the time to try to do, but we are looking for money. We hire anthropology, we fire anthropology, we hire social mobilizers, we fire it again, waiting for the money, and we call them again. And this was not, you are not really, really good for us. Uh, another resources needed is social anthropology needed to support the knowledge of the context and building intercultural bridge. John Sumo talked about it. Communicators' capacity, so and funds and coordination, SOP or dissemination or recommunication, and the role of data, knowledge, and understanding the context, appropriateness of the messages, develop effective strategies, real time sharing of information, advocacy to support decision taking, monitoring and evaluation of intervention, performance measurement, and how to integrate. Recruit a data manager, I talked about it yesterday. Recruit a social anthropologist. Share data with partners and decision takers weekly to support decision taking. Develop a practical guide with tools and tips on how to do for a systematic integration of data and evidence and performance measurement. How should progress be evaluated? Develop evaluation protocols and tools. Undertake rapid assessment surveys before, during, and after the intervention. Assess the satisfaction, track initial responses, and continuously share the assessment with communities and with partners to support decision taken. Risk communication, to conclude, is not a standalone, but a cross-cutting pillar. Risk communicators must be open-minded and ready to innovate. Please, use new approaches. Innovate, be yourself. Although the emergency, take time, not to rush for action. Once someone talked about not rushing for action yesterday. Listen, please, listen. Respect, share, work together, hand in hand. Result the pace on the individual in the center of all the health intervention. Risk communication is also a matter of empathy. Diversity is richness. Thank you very much.